Hi, everyone. Um, it's actually a, a wonderful pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, really grateful for the invitation from the Gilbrea Center um, to come and talk. There's a number of connections I hope that you'll pick up throughout my talk today, both with Gavin and some other people in the room in terms of research, um, and a very strong connection between the Gilbrea Center for Studies in Aging and the Trent Center for Aging and Society, uh, which we view as partner uh, centers in, in our broader endeavor to bring aging and critical perspectives on aging to the forefront, both regionally in Ontario, but more importantly internationally. Um, and there's a number of people that are associated and members of our Trent Center who are from McMaster and a number of people who are members of the Gilbrea Center, including our visionary at Trent, that's Dr. Stephen Katz, who really led the way in terms of critical thinking on aging. Um, and so I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, rural aging research and uh, take you through uh, what I see as a, a conversation around, um, in many ways, uh, a hidden story about rural research within gerontology. So those of us who do rural research know very well gerontological aspects and so on, but there's a lot of gerontology that hasn't paid much attention to rural, and so that's part of my agenda today along with to show you a number of images of what Peterborough looks like at different points to sort of convince you that this is a good place uh, for you to go. Many of you uh, may have connections to Peterborough, but if you don't, um, we'll certainly try to convince you that it's a, a good location. Okay. Um, so I introduce you to a field that we refer to as rural gerontology. Um, I'm going to get you to think, hopefully, a bit differently about what rural aging is and what um, aging rural communities are and the different challenges and opportunities. Um, and then uh, provoke a bit of discussion about what this means for gerontology in general. Um, and so these are sort of the three things I want to take you through. This is Trent University, where I'm located, and our very pithy uh, slogan. I always like to think of it as it should say, challenge the way we think, as in you know, what we're doing at the institution. Um, this is partly, to, again, uh, it's my job at a small liberal arts research intensive university to point out that it's actually the best place to do academic work because you get to sort of enjoy these kinds of environments. I like this because when we're talking about the frontiers of something, <clears throat> Our offices look north into Peterborough and Halberton County, and these are the rural regions that I'm going to talk about today. So some of the research I'm going to refer to is actually from these small towns and villages that you might see off in the distance here, uh, but also metaphorically, this is, this is what it represents. Um, some acknowledgments. So this um, presentation I'm giving is actually part of a book proposal that's being developed by myself and two colleagues. One is Dr. Kieran, Professor Kieran Walsh now um, at the National University of Ireland and uh, Dr. Rachel Winterton in Australia. Uh, we've developed a book proposal around critical rural gerontology and in many ways what I'm presenting to you today is sort of rehearsing an argument we're making for the need to move this field of scholarship forward. And I think it's always very important to also um, highlight uh, who I've learned from or we've learned from in terms of luminaries in the field. Um, and so people like Alan Joseph and Norman Keating from Canada, Thomas Sharp from the UK, and Jenny Warburton from Australia, for me personally, have been mentors in the field of rural aging. And one of the reasons I'm putting the names up here is not so that if we you disagree with some things I'm saying, I can point to them as you know, where the source is. You will actually see their names come up in the presentation from some very important quotes that I want to leave you with. So you get a sense of you know, where this scholarship has come from. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Gavin Andrews and Malcolm Kutchin, who are here today, um, long-standing collaborators on sort of the second part of what we're doing today. So I'm also supposed to shamelessly promote this book through the talk. Um, but I'll put it down for now. That's why Gavin set up two different uh, parts of the event. Um, two things. One is that the structure of this kind of address is actually directly modeled on uh, what I consider the best plenary address I've ever seen, which is one that Malcolm Kutchin gave in Niagara Falls in 2014 at the Canadian Association of Gerontology. Um, and also there's a number of things I'm going to refer to in terms of Gavin's leadership in geographical gerontology throughout this, uh, throughout this presentation. But you're not implicated uh, by your name in here, so you're safe if there's any questions. Uh, and if I don't acknowledge the Canada Research Chairs program, then they will come and remove me from the room before I can finish, so that's why that uh, slide is up there. All right, if I don't show you anything else, I want you to uh, take a look at Ted Matka. He's from the county, as we refer to, Prince Edward County. This is what I think you should have as an image of rural aging, which is not what you think it is. So throughout the presentation, we're going to talk about myths, 
idols, romantic views, misconceptions about rural, and that's sort of part of my job as a research chair looking at rural aging is to help debunk and challenge those myths intellectually but also in terms of policy and programming. And I like putting this up because it gets us immediately thinking about rural aging not from a, um, a dependent, uh, disadvantaged viewpoint, which is how we mostly think of rural regions and rural people, and there's a lot of um, empirical evidence that rural people and rural communities are disadvantaged and there are issues with health status and so on. Um, but if that's the only viewpoint we have of rural, then we're going to miss many of the layers of complexity that we have in terms of rural problems. And so uh, this is sort of the starting point I want to leave you with. Sadly, Ted has, has passed on at this point, but he's still referred to quite fondly as the garlic guru from the county. Um, how many people are from a rural area? Okay. So you will be well aware of some of the things that I'm referring to, but I'm also going to rehearse a couple things about rural to convince those of you who are not from rural areas what we're talking about. Um, there's different ways of thinking about rural. Statistics Canada would give us what we refer to as a uh, rural and small town definition or different definitions based on commuting zones. It's really referred to population size and distance from a major urban center as what designates something rural from metropolitan or from major urban, for example. We can also define rural in terms of how people think of themselves as rural, so the attributes and the amenities that they view, so social connections, uh, access to nature, and so on. Um, and I like this comment that Roger Plato, he's a geography professor emeritus from Laurentian University. Um, anyone in rural geography has been using the slogan now for probably two decades in terms of a coffee cup definition of rural, but it really points out the fact that sometimes it's hard to figure out what rural actually is. And when I get to later in the presentation talking about the need to think about diverse experiences or the different continuum of types of rural communities in which older people are living, then these are the kinds of definitions that we have to think about. Not the coffee cup one, but the fact that there might be ones that are based on population and there might be ones that are just based on people's own image of themselves as rural. And so if we use this definition and then this uh, crafty map I got from Wikipedia, then rural Canada would look like this if we went by its importance. And of course that doesn't really represent most of our view of what rural Canada is. Rural is a continuum of settlements from very, very highly populated developed settlements on the fringe of urban communities, so the surrounding the Hamilton metropolitan area or the GT area in our reference point here, we would see all kinds of communities like this one, which is one of the Maddie subdivisions um, in terms of representing a farm field that's now a brand new subdivision and that's still considered a peri-urban or, peri or rural fringe environment through to more conventional, prosperous or less prosperous agricultural rural settlements. In the Ontario context, we can think of Oxford County, um, different counties in and around this region down in Niagara as well that represent uh, that type of rural. And then we have the more remote type of rural settings. And so this is a picture of an outport at the top from, uh, from the Maritimes. But here we're talking about resource dependent communities, often very, very uh, far away from urban centers and transportation routes and so on. And if you think about a question, for example, as a geographer would, about the experiences of the people who live here or the uh, types of decisions that planners have to make about where to locate things like hospitals or services for older people, for example. The complexion of these communities in terms of density, access to transportation, social economic status and so on are going to be very, very different. And so that's one of the underlying geographical realities of rural that we need to think about when we're talking about rural aging and aging rural communities. There's two trends that are very important for you to know. One is that through time, Canada has become an increasingly urban society, and so uh, countries throughout the world are urbanizing. Uh, this graph with the very pithy folks, which represents rural, and city folks, which represents urban, shows us that from you know, the first census in 1851 through to where we are today, we can see that the urban population represented in blue, of course, has skyrocketed. So about 80% to 90% of Canada's population live in urban settings. Um, and that is not just, for example, downtown uh, metropolitan settings like downtown Toronto, it's the whole range of urban settings in a continuum just like we think of in terms of rural. And so this is actually an important thing to understand that the proportion of people living in rural areas actually has been eclipsed by those living in urban. But what's more important is actually where the older population is represented in this kind of information. So the National Post did geographers 
and geographers engaging in wonderful service a number of years ago by putting on one of their front pages a map, where do the oldest Canadians live? And we see this and realize what a useful tool for presentations like this, hopefully. Um, in terms of understanding that while the proportion, the absolute numbers of rural people in Canada are smaller, so 20% of the population versus 80, the proportion of people over 65 in rural areas is actually much higher in rural communities than they are in urban. And so all you need to do on this map is look at the darker shades of blue. Darker shades of blue represent areas of Canada with higher proportions of people over 65. And if we zoom into this southern Ontario kind of GTA context, and I've indicated Peterborough County, the sort of cloggy boot shaped county up here. Um, you know, you see around sort of urban areas is where the rural population actually is technically the oldest. Um, and so that's the two trends that are important to understand sort of numerically. And I'm a qualitative researcher, so I'm going to leave numbers behind very quickly and get you into some qualitative information. But the fact that we have an urbanizing society, but it's the rural population is actually the population is aging more rapidly, not that people are getting older, but that the, the numbers are. So this, without any of the conversation, would lead us to have all kinds of questions in terms of policy and planning and programming, and what that means in terms of a country where the focus of political and policy uh, attention is predominantly urban, especially because of that proportion of the population. And yet the people who might be most vulnerable in those elder years, there's more of them living in rural environments. And that's the kind of question that many of us are driven to build our careers around in terms of rural research. So I showed you nice things about Peterborough, what a nice view. Now I've showed you that it's this dark blue, older population, you can still decide whether that's good. For researchers, of course, it's great, but that's a different way of thinking about things. I'm going to take you through maybe three slides that give you sort of an overview of what rural aging trends and challenges and opportunities are, just to sort of flesh out some of the issues that I'm, I'm hinting at. So one is that rural populations around the world are actually proportionally older than, than urban populations. So it's not just an Ontario issue or a Peterborough issue or a Canadian issue, it's actually a global north and global south issue. Um, we know, for example, in Peterborough County that I just showed you, uh, it's actually was the oldest and is now the second oldest metropolitan unit in the country at 22% of the population over 65. So that's what one in five, and that matches up with nationally the oldest country in the world, which is Japan. So what's happening in Peterborough County in those rural areas and small towns is something that the rest of Canada is going to have to think about, you know, in a decade or two decades to come. Um, the processes involved are fairly straightforward. Rural areas, because of those population numbers I showed you, are in decline. So people are leaving rural areas, predominantly in their younger years, for employment or for education opportunities. We have older people choosing to what we call age in place. And so people for um, love of their community and sense of place are staying on. And also for lack of resources to move out of rural areas are staying there as they get older. And so that's a process that's happening. And we also have um, what people consider relatively recent, but in many regions has actually been happening for decades and decades and decades. And that's people either returning to or moving into rural regions in their retirement years, either to convert seasonal homes or to finance part of their retirement by selling property in urban areas and buying cheaper property in, in rural um, and more remote areas. And so that process has led to a number of things within that population. So there's increasing vulnerability in rural areas in terms of health status because of the number of people that are over 65 and especially over 80. And there's also what we call strained support networks. So one of the things happening in rural areas, as I'll show you in a moment, is a lack of formal supports and services that you find in urban areas. And that puts more expectations on families and households and communities and volunteers to fill in those gaps. And if you throw on top of that, Geography, so distance, for example, it's a lot harder for support networks to sort of carry that burden in rural areas than we might assume in urban ones. So the challenges. We have rapidly aging populations. We have a long-standing sense that rural areas in terms of services have always been deprived or declining. So we just have to think, if any of you would raise your hand, it will be from a rural community. If you think about the threats to close hospitals or schools in rural environments, that represents that kind of issue with services. We have broader processes of change, so restructuring of economies due to globalization and resource sectors where mines might close and then reopen and what that causes um, in different types of rural settings. And that's happening across agricultural, resource, rural recreational, peri-urban settings. So that whole continuum of rural I talked about is being affected by different processes 
And we need to understand those when we think about what is the experience or decisions people make in relation to rural aging. And it's led, um, especially in the 2000s, a real sense of questioning. There's a bit of an assumption that rural areas are nice and cozy and socially cohesive and healthy and good places to grow old. And if you throw these kinds of challenges on it, there's a whole bunch of work that's now or has been critiquing this arguably for about 30 years, although we've started to pay more and more attention to it in the last decade or so. So you'll see I'm showing you newspaper clippings because it's sometimes helpful. Uh, the previous ones were from Huffington Post and the National Post. This one's from the Toronto Star. So our nurse, our nurse metropolitan GTA newspaper or national newspaper, but certainly urban focus. And I always like using this because I thought the really scary caution sign of the older rural person, you know, crossing the street as if this is what's happening in our rural environments. And I'm kind of showing this to you in a, you know, to get you thinking about what the negative parts are in terms of our assumptions. I learned as a young graduate student that it's really easy to talk about problems, and then I had a um, one of our rural studies mentors from British Columbia pointed out um, in a presentation I gave many, many years ago, you've told us all the problems, haven't you heard anything positive about rural communities? And I thought, oh, I guess that's what I should be doing as an academic. So I like to end on opportunities before we get into a bit of the scholarship side of how, you know, a gerontologist we've been thinking about this. So the story about rural is not one just of decline and deprivation and all these things. We're actually talking about um, a segment of the population that does live up to the assumptions we often have in terms of popular media about things like higher levels of resilience and ability to innovate and so on. And many rural resource sectors and so on are known to have been doing this uh, for decades and decades and decades. So a number of the opportunities that we're seeing happening is that those communities facing uh, aging and rural decline are renewing their economies based on the demographic change. And so retirement living has actually become a model that a number of communities are are curving towards in terms of renewing their economy. Uh, we have a number of rural innovations that we're pointing towards in terms of lessons we can learn from rural environments about the challenges that all communities face in an aging society. And so age-friendly communities, uh, which of course was launched by the WHO globally about a decade ago in 2007, um, one of the leading um, initiatives that came out of that in Canada was the designation of a rural and remote age-friendly community guide. And Canada led nationally in terms of the discussion on that. Um, but we also see other things related to rural aging. So things like healthcare integration has been going on in rural areas um, in ways that many of our regional and the Ontario contact LINs are looking what's happening in some of our smaller rural hospitals. They're actually taking over and housing a number of social and community support services that are, are helping support older people in the community in ways that are almost inconceivable in a metropolitan setting just because of the size and structure and scale of the institutions. But the lessons that we can learn from that can certainly be transferred you know, across the country. Another interesting thing that's come up, um, and this is one of the things that I've been working on in terms of my interest in volunteering and aging communities, is an increasing recognition of the actual role of older residents themselves. So instead of a, a view of older people as dependents who are only going to be the recipients of services like Meals of Wheels and community supports and so on, is actually thinking through what are the contributions they make within their communities. And so we only have to turn to things like um, Community Care Peterborough, which is an agency I've worked with now for about 12 years, which runs through 900 volunteers in the county, about 12 different kinds of programs like Meals and Wheels and Foot Clinics and so on. And the majority of the volunteers of those 900 that are doing it are actually over 70. Um, and just for you know, another important lens we put on rural is that the majority of those volunteers are women. So there's about 20% you know, of the community care population of volunteers is men, and they're all over 70. So the contribution to them back to their community is actually quite high. And that's in stark contrast to thinking about older people in rural areas as just dependents and waiting to receive frozen meals and so on in, in cottages and farms. More importantly, it's not just community support and volunteering, but um, increasing research on the role of older residents in terms of leadership within communities. And so in many ways we're thinking about when you have people retiring to communities or people that are aging in place within communities, what is the role that those older residents are playing in terms of leadership for things like economic renewal or new initiatives like age friendliness that come along. And most times uh, volunteer boards and so on are being populated in rural areas by a very few number a very almost overburdened older volunteers who take on those leadership roles. And so it's a very important contribution, but it's also one that we're viewing uh, with a bit of concern about how sustainable that is when, it's, uh, when those people are getting older themselves. 
So there's a number of important lessons to learn, and uh, when I come back at the end of the presentation, I'll try to highlight what some of those are. Also what's happening, I think, is anyone who thinks about rural, and quite frankly urban, knows that where we live and what we do, everything's very complex. And in rural aging, one of the quotes, so well, there's probably about six quotes that I would leave you with, especially if you were a graduate student thinking about this field. Claire Wenger um, wrote an article in 2001 in Aging Society called The Myths and Realities of uh, Rural Aging in Britain. And this is one of the famous sort of you know, uh, opening lines she uses. It's not a pure cut rosy picture of chocolate box cottages in the glow of hazy sunshine. And it doesn't quite translate directly to the North American context unless we're in Victoria or Kingston that has sort of the anglophilia with the chocolate box cottages that you can go and actually purchase. But I stole a borrowed uh, Wikipedia. Uh, I know this is going to be recorded, so there you go. Um, an image from Elliot Lake. So Elliot Lake is probably one of our most famous retirement living rural communities in Canada. So Victoria, BC tends to be viewed as the retirement community in Canada, but of course it's a metropolitan uh, centre. And so this is what Elliott Lake, quite rightly, they're recruiting people to move to Elliott Lake. The mines in Elliott Lake closed in the 1990s. 90% 90 of the workforce left, so all those younger families left. And what was left behind were older people who wanted to age in place or couldn't leave, and people who were on disability pensions and so on who were already there for low-cost housing. And Elliott Lake and the council and so on had to figure out what do we do next. So they turned, and in many ways, pioneered retirement living in a rural context. And so for now, for about two decades, they have successfully renewed their entire economy around this concept and people are able to move back into a community which has lower cost housing. And this is the type of imagery they use. So you can sit in your Muskoka or your Kawartha or your Adirondack chairs, depending on what rural region you're from. <laughs> you can hold hands and you can be wealthy and white and have shiny teeth, although you can barely see them. And that's the image that we see. And of course, this is something that we're trying to critique a little bit when we think about you know, what is a policymaker who looks at Elliott Lake might say, well, they don't need to keep the hospital running or they won't need you know, extra funding for Meals and Wheels programs because look how happy these sort of people are. Of course, policymakers don't look at this and make decisions like that, but this is what we see in terms of popular media. So it's this idol of what it means to be older in a rural environment that actually has led to some really interesting conversations around what I would call the sort of paradox of thinking over rural aging, that lots of people want to move there in their retirement years or viewing it as a good option, and lots of people are required to volunteer in their old years in rural areas to keep all these programs going, um, but if everyone in these rural environments is getting older and older, what's going to happen 10 years from now or 20 years from now in terms of how those social support networks and social structures are, are operating? And that last comment doesn't come from me as an academic observer reading from my office in Peterborough, gazing out into that frontier. It comes from a quote from an interview I had as a PhD student with a rural service provider in Prince Edward County who told me this wonderful story about how because of connections to the church and because of connections to the school and because of the ruralness of their environment, everyone seemed to get along and support each other and shovel each other's driveways and look in on each other. And then she paused and said, I don't think that's really the case. I'm really worried that my eight-year-old Meals and Wheels driver will fail his next exam to keep his license, and I won't be able to deliver meals to the six people that he's been delivering to for the past 10 years. And those sort of comments stick in my mind as a critical academic, going, all right, there's some uncertainty about this, and there's a bit of a paradox in terms of our, our expectations. But yes, Elliot Lake is wonderful. Uh, I shouldn't pick on it. <clears throat> Okay, so that's an overview of rural aging trends and challenges and opportunities. I want to take you through a little bit about the story of what rural gerontology is. So this is just taking you through a bit of the paper trail of how long has gerontologists and those of us who come to gerontology from other disciplines, so myself as a geographer and someone who has training in international development, came to aging because I was really interested in how rural communities were responding to change. And then I started working in all these rural communities in Canada, and the context was aging, and all the initiatives we were talking about happened to relate to things like Meals on Wheels and social support and so on. So that's sort of my personal journey. So Brad Rolls, who um, isn't someone that I've directly worked with, but is someone who has had a huge effect in terms of rural aging scholarship, uh, wrote a paper in 1988 in the Journal of Rural Studies, basically asking, you know, what is the rural in rural aging? 
and sort of did a really nice expose looking at rural Appalachia in the United States um, in terms of understanding the experiences and challenges of individuals who were living there. And pointed out in this, you know, almost two decades ago, three decades ago, sorry, I told you I'd move away from numbers, um, made this comment, and in many ways we're still making this argument today, that we've had uh, about 40 or 50 years of scholarship pointing to rural as a really rich environment to study aging issues, and yet we really don't have rural gerontology as a distinctive field yet, and that's one of the reasons we're conceiving of a book in that direction. So I'm going to shift away from text, although I'll bring you back to text in a moment. Um, I thought I'd take you through a bit of a historiography of rural gerontology as I've been able to discover it with my two colleagues in Ireland and Australia. And I'm just showing you book covers to give you examples of what we're referring to. Um, one of the more important things, and this, uh, if anyone is wondering why it's important to establish multi or interdisciplinary centers, whether they're on aging or not, but certainly ones that relate to aging, is I was introduced to all kinds of um, important books written by historians, uh, written by philosophers, written by people in English literature, by my colleague Stephen Katz, who I mentioned earlier, who really helped create the vision for uh, what we have at Trent University that I never would have been able to be directed towards as just someone working within geography or within the type of disciplines that, that my sort of uh, viewpoints were. What I have here is an image of one of three books um, that would have been published in the 1990s around sort of the history of gerontology as a science. And so Thomas Cole um, did a, histor a history of kind of the cultural legacy of, of um, gerontology in America. And I have this up to sort of point out a historiography or the story of rural gerontology really starts with the fact that many of the settings and images within which we think about aging through time are set in rural environments. And so the imagery of this uh, book is meant to convey that in terms of how a historian might think about gerontology. And of course, we just have to think about that change in time from rural to urban. If we go back into the 1920s and previous to that, it was rural areas, for example, in Canada that had more political power and had almost more population than urban areas. And so, of course, most thinking at the time around you know, what it meant to grow older or provide services or do recreation activities might occur within that context. And so we owe a debt in many ways to historians of gerontology for helping position rural in that regard. And I think many fields would have that as part of our sort of collective societal evolution. Um, if we start a historiography in terms of where we start to see the literature, so when I set a comprehensive exam question for PhD students in geographies of aging or gerontology, we would say, well, let's think about things for time, and they would look at these books and go, do I really have to read them? And then I would call people at my class, or like Gavin and his colleagues, and say, and they would agree, yeah, they do, so here you go. Um, what I brought here are just examples of two types of studies where we have people who may not identify as gerontologists, but we were put under the compendium of gerontology now, um, working on you know, issues of older rural Americans, and in this case, family and community life in Ireland. And this is a great example, and we've seen this through time, of people that return to studies that were done in previous eras and sort of reinterpret transcripts or reinterpret or even do longitudinal studies. And so this work here by Armstrong um, in Ireland actually goes back and looks at research that was done in the 1940s in terms of rural life in Ireland and understanding aging. And then they were able to sort of update that study in the 2000s. And so this is sort of the starting point for thinking about rural aspects of gerontology. And it really comes out of work in the United States, uh, work in the UK, and work, quite frankly, for the majority part of Europe within Germany. I don't speak or read German, so I'm going to leave this as more of an English language publication or a presentation for you. If we move into the 80s and 90s, we start to see a growing interest in identifying some of those challenges um, and complexities of rural aging. So I know you can't see the covers very well, but The Elderly in Rural Society by Coward gets published in the, in the early 80s. We have the Journal of Rural Studies itself being established in 1985, and one of its first uh, issues has these publications by people like Graham Rolls asking questions about rural aging within it. And we also have, into the 1990s, enough momentum in the field for the first international conference on rural aging or rural gerontology. And what's interesting is, as far as my reading of the literature is, it's only Graham Rolls who's really using the term rural gerontology throughout this era. He's, you know, we're talking about rural aging, which, you know, gets people thinking about it differently than an actual academic pursuit. Rural aging really connotes issues and challenges and things we might try to solve problems on. 
And so this is an important era where many of um, the types of ideas that we still use today start to come to fruition rather than just contextual empirical information about what it means to live in rural America or rural Ireland as an alert person. We get into the 2000s and we start to see an even further progression <clears throat> in terms of challenging the role of research to debunk these myths and assumptions we have about rural aging. So this is where Claire Wanger's uh, influential paper in Aging Society gets published. We start to see the influence from other disciplines and perspectives in terms of championing rural aging as a field. And so I partly to flatter my host, um, uh, Gavin Andrews and David Phillips, one of the most influential chapters of rural aging actually comes out of a book that Gavin published in 2005 by, by Alan Joseph and Denise Kluche Fisher, where they coined the term vulnerable older people living in vulnerable rural places. And that sort of idea of your aging as a source of vulnerability, but communities also undergoing all this decline and change as a site of vulnerability is really influential in terms of, for example, my PhD that would have followed out of this era. We have things like rural retirement migration as an empirical theme being taken up and actually you know, driven forward within the scholarship in terms of understanding, not just in contexts like Elliott Lake or Peterborough, Ontario, or places like uh, Toronto where people are moving, but what does this mean internationally? People who are moving from the UK, for example, to Spain in terms of rural retirement migration, moving into international rural environments where the language is completely different and the social networks are completely separate in terms of how people can access each other. And at this point, we have arguably one of the most influential books published by Nora Keating, who's one of the people I refer to from the University of Alberta, who put together the first edited collection, really challenging this question around, is rural a good place to grow old? And used a human ecology approach from environmental gerontology to really push forward sort of debates in this era. And you'll notice, as I take you through each of these, you're glad I'm not putting up more titles, because we just have this kind of lecture go on for six hours. Until so I show you a slide like this. I hope you've noticed my skills at PowerPoint. I've taken you from a slide with one book cover to two book covers. The effect is that you go, oh, this is a burgeoning field. Look at all the work that's happening in the 2010s. Well, it just happens to be the case. And so we are in an era where rural, for a number of reasons that I'll explain in a moment, really has started to come to the forefront. And that's not to say it's in front of urban aging issues or in front of other perspectives. It's just become a really fruitful area of scholarship. So I'm not going to take you through all of this. Um, what I really want to point out is that we have a number of books being published tackling different aspects of rural aging. So in the UK, we have the Countryside Connection book, which really looked at social connectivity as one of the key ingredients of people succeeding in aging in rural environments. We have a book about aging and resource communities that was published um, internationally, looking at those specific contexts of places like Elliott Lake, so probing rural aging in sort of non-conventional settings. We have international handbooks from other parts of gerontology, so rural, sorry, rural studies here, and then the one above that you can't quite see the title of is the Handbook of Cultural Gerontology, where key chapters are actually talking about rural aging. So people within rural studies and gerontology are starting to say, when we're designing a book, we need a rural chapter. And that may sound sort of like a, you know, a strange thing to say in terms of you know, people just making decisions, but in previous eras, they wouldn't have considered that. That wouldn't have been on the list of things that needed to be within these books. And then lastly, uh, I promised Gavin and Alp might have one image of our book, but I'll save talking about that till later. Okay, so it's a burgeoning field. What has led to this? Why is this actually important today? There's three terms that I want to point you to, and this is an interpretation I'm using, which sometimes isn't shared by others in the literature. In terms of conflating environmental and geographical aspects under one thing we might call a spatial turn. And what I'm linking here is the idea that within environmental gerontology, which uh, predates geographical um, gerontology in terms of its sort of formation as a field, we've had a lot of interest in context of aging. What does it mean where you live and the social and natural environment and built environment that surrounds you, and how does that affect you as an aging individual or as a society? We also have the rise of the interest in geographical concepts to help explain experiences and processes and outcomes of aging. So scale and place and space and beauty. Now what's interesting within them is that rural, as I've shown you, has been a long-standing theme within gerontology literature, but it's often been very disparate. So within, especially within geographical gerontology, for some reason geographers have really been interested in rural much more than other aspects of disciplines within gerontology. 
although people like Claire Weiber and others are coming from sociology and, and so on. And so it's an uneven approach to thinking about rural aging, but this spatial turn has been quite important and influential. The second turn is what we would call global. So a number of processes have led to rural coming to the forefront. Um, one is that the increasing interest in the impact of globalization on individuals' life experiences right across the social sciences and humanities has become quite important. And so of course this includes everyone around the world, rural and urban. What's happening in terms of globalization is this greater interest in the movement of older people, migration, mobility of older population in terms of things like retirement migration, especially international retirement migration, and also the impact of technology. So one of the reasons rural aging and aging rural communities become a little more interesting is people looking at them saying, you can now succeed in a healthy uh, aging experience in rural environments because you have internet, or because you have Skype, or because you have all these different technological um, advancements. And of course, you don't have to drive too far north of Peterborough or other parts of Ontario when broadband fails and there is no internet and all those things disappear and then you're right back down to the realities of, of what it means to try to use technology as that kind of link. The second thing is that with um, the endorsement of age-friendly communities, rural areas have been looked to, one, as an area where there's lots of problems to solve, and this is really what this sort of Canada's need in the age-friendly um, guide is. And I just taking an excerpt image from their uh, publication to show you the types of consultations that we're doing in terms of the different types of communities. But also because a number of people have been advocating for rural communities as sources of innovation in terms of age friendliness. So if we use volunteerism as an example, one of the key ingredients of an age friendly community to be registered with the WHO is to show high levels of participation amongst older people. And so volunteering is one of those and rural communities were often thought of and still are thought of as sources of great volunteering and social cohesion and connectedness, not to mention those sort of myths and realities that I just referred to. And so many people within global or even urban studies of age friendliness have used rural models of volunteering to try to explain how that process works. And this is one of the first times that rural lessons start to show up in the literature that's not rural in terms of aging, which is an interesting way of thinking about that type of influence. And one of the important points to make here is that within gerontology, the emphasis on rural aging has been predominantly Western or geared towards countries of the global north. And this is, stands in stark contrast to fields like demography, where there's been a more, much more explicit global emphasis in terms of understanding rural issues and rural demography and population change in the global south. And so this represents one of those big gaps that we're grappling with in terms of rural gerontology, and I would say gerontology more broadly. Spatial turn, global turn, critical turn. So it's hard to not come to Gilbrea, throw names like Stephen Katz around, who many of you may never think of again, but inspires us to think critically. And Stephen's one of those people who wrote a book in 96, um, really challenging and thinking about gerontology as a discipline that wasn't really asking hard questions about aging. And so phrases like aging isn't what you think it is, that might show up on a billboard now, or the kinds of things that Stephen would have asked us to think about in the 90s. So that's why we're referring to his sort of visionary leadership. So critical gerontology, just to reverse this for you, is this idea that not everyone has the same experience and that we need to actually think of different ways to account for and um, address different experiences across a whole bunch of different types of social indicators, not just age, but gender and sexuality and identity and so on. Um, I just have to show you a page, picture of the garlic guru in Fitzgerald County, Ted, who's smiling and is looking vibrant. That's a very different experience than someone who's in a wheelchair in a long-term care home in Elliott Lake, um, who's struggling as a, an older rural resident. The emphasis within the critical term really is on diversity and life course, thinking about things like inclusion and exclusion, and what are the processes of that, and how, for example, a good question within this might be, if we're promoting volunteerism, one of the things that uh, myself and other colleagues are working on is the ways in which volunteerism sometimes marginalizes people further than it does include them. Right? So many people will say, I'm volunteering to provide you wheels on wheels, you the older person, you're just a recipient of services, I don't need you to participate in this process. And so that sort of contrasts our view of participation. And you don't have to worry, this, I'm not selling my quote, but this is just a quote that makes uh, this argument for the call to understand the diversity um, in terms of how we construct and contest rural aging environments um, from this critical perspective. I'd rather you think about what Nora Keating has to say, 
Um, in terms of weather, we get to actually time for what we call a rural term. And so this, you know, you can tell I'm setting up this book proposal as if you guys are reviewing it for me, but you'll, you'll sort of uh, allow me to do that today, I hope. Um, Nora, there's uh, another thing that's important to understand is that there has been a lot of Canadian leadership in terms of rural aging and rural gerontology. So people like Alan Joseph and Nora Keating and others have really helped push us in this direction. And so Nora and colleagues did a review of rural aging literature in the Canadian Journal on Aging in 2011 and really pointed out this need to look at diverse experiences, this need to look at the complexity of different places. And what I get most excited about as a geographer is what does it mean for the sustainability of rural communities? What does it mean when you have an 80 year old driver of Wheels on Wheels who supports 10 people out in a big rural region who is on the cusp of not being able to drive any longer because of exams in terms of um, transportation board requirements and so on. These are really important questions to ask in terms of does that mean the community is a sustainable place to move to in your, in your retirement? Okay, so that was sort of luxury. I'd like to show you some examples of work that's actually underway and partly as a way of showing you what I think some of the key themes are in rural aging today. Um, <clears throat> Including a video clip, so at some point I'll start talking, stop talking, and you'll watch uh, the video. Okay, so rural aging research. Um, I'm going to borrow something that Gavin uh, pioneered for us in a previous publication in terms of thinking about themes within a field. So I want to talk about long standing themes that started a long time ago and are still with us today, emergent themes that we've seen emerge over the last decade or so and then what we call hidden themes. So themes that we know are out there, we're starting to see either as academics or we're hearing from people within communities, but no one's actually been able to sort of grapple with them yet. So some of these themes I'll have talked to, uh, alluded to before, but this idea of looking at physical and social environments of rural aging have been quite prominent. Questions around infrastructure and services and supports and how we might advise, for example, school boards or health boards in terms of how they provide services um, have been around for quite a while. Experiences of aging, whether it's psychological, behavioral, or sociological perspective, have been around for quite a while. And this is where the work of Graham Rolls has been very important in some of his, his work in, in rural Appalachia. And place attachment. So leading to this idea of what, what, what draws people to connect to their community in terms of wanting to stay there, or that the community kind of draws them there either positively or negatively in terms of their connection. So aging in place is something we refer to quite uh, strongly today, certainly starting in the 2000s, but it has its roots back in these early eras of rural aging research. The examples I'm going to give you are from Trent uh, University or people who've worked at Trent. Um, in terms of experiences of rural aging, uh, what I'm showing here are excerpts from uh, an MA thesis that was done on rural aging and care in Peterborough County. And the two excerpts I show you, I want to really show you where we're at in terms of trying to debunk the complexity of an aging rural community. And this might be very, especially for those of you that are, you know, had, uh, say that you're living in rural environments, you know, this is the friendliest, best place to live in the world. I wouldn't move for any in the world. I love my neighbors, etc. Just to paraphrase, um, we have a post office, so many places are losing their post offices and so on. Um, and this is a real common sentiment, and this is not a romantic view of rural environments. When we do interviews, so hundreds and hundreds of interviews and all these different case studies that I'm involved in and my colleagues are involved in, we hear this continuously across that continuum of rural. People want to live in rural environments because of these connections. And that is something that is qualitatively and quantitatively different than living in an urban environment. And to qualify that, that doesn't mean that you don't find connections in urban environments, it's just ways connections are made are a little bit different. And so I uh, enjoyed an uh, anecdote that someone shared for me at an age-friendly meeting in Pedro where they said, I see all this stuff you said about the little village, but I live in an apartment building and I would say the same thing about my apartment building. I love living here, I love my neighbors and so on. So there's something universal about it. On the other hand, we get the contrast that people point out, okay, we have this, but there's some, I would say, this is the paradox or uncertainty about thinking about aging rural communities. Um, we don't deliberately visit back and forth, so how socially cohesive are you if you ignore your neighbors? Right? And many of us, if we think about our own interactions, we're in an era where there's less connections that way. Um, and this idea that communities are changing themselves, so the traditional, or the view of what a traditional rural community has changed, and many of that links to those broader processes of restructuring, globalization, and so on. 
And the reason I like these two quotes is partly because of the post office connection, or the bank connection was another quote I could have used, where a number of rural communities start to slowly lose either social institutions, like churches and social clubs that don't have membership, or they're slowly losing the actual bricks and mortar that made certain parts of the community uh, had a central role in the community, like schools or post offices. And once those are gone, the sort of social network and the reason people had to gather sort of disappears. So this is what we do, you know, currently. We're seeing this within literature, but it takes us back to stuff that people would have told us or hinted at in the 1970s. The emergent themes, so I would, I'm roughly using two decade old point story here in terms of the 1990s, really is that aging in place comes to the forefront in terms of trying to understand, perhaps politically promote aging in place as something that's very positive and should be enabled if people want to stay on in their homes. And of course this has as much to do with environments, policies, and experiences as it has to do with understanding, especially at the beginning of the 1980s, this idea that maybe people shouldn't age in institutions. That maybe most people would prefer to age in their homes or within their communities and not have to move into into institutional long-term care environments. And so there's different um, pathways into why aging in place has come to the forefront. We start to see rural retirement migration, not just trends, but the idea of rural communities being able to sell themselves as an amenity rich environment that you might retire to. I've often wondered when I've been Elliott Lake and Tumbler Ridge in BC and all these little mining towns that I love going because I've got sort of a rural uh, love affair going, I suppose, is to, if you could move to southern parts of Spain, instead of Elliot Lake, that sounds pretty good as well, but I mean, you have to live in the UK in order to contemplate that, that transition. That's really a tangent, I can talk about that after. <laughs> um, the community dimensions come to the forefront, so if we think about how disciplines or interdisciplines evolve, social and community aspects of gerontology start to play a role, and I was asking questions around participation and volunteering and so on, and this really starts to come out in the 1990s. And of course, age-friendly communities starts its roots here in terms of how we actually plan for communities that will support older people. So age-friendliness is one of those cute buzzwords that we're throwing around now and the, and the government's funding all kinds of programs. One of the big challenges that we're working on um, at Trent with uh, a colleague is the implementation gap between receiving funding, getting your community registered as age-friendly with the WHO, and then what? Do the sidewalks actually get fixed? Do the policies actually change and so on? And so that's part of the gaps we're working on at this, at this point in time. So the example I want to give you of this work is someone I'll introduce you, Andrew Kolibaba, uh, who's defending this thesis in April. Um, and this is looking at volunteering in aging communities and not just the characteristics of volunteers or the trends of volunteering, but what is the role of older volunteers who are actually running a rural library what is the role of that for the community itself in terms of the cohesion and the sustainability and the age friendliness of a community? And so Amber's been working with the Selwyn Public Library, which is a library that has three branches in little towns and villages just north of Trent University, um, or, or Peterborough uh, in terms of the city. And volunteer-based libraries are fairly unique in rural areas. Most libraries, in fact most libraries in general are run by paid staff by municipalities. Um, and so this project actually originated with a previous board member coming to Trent and saying, I've got this amazing volunteer program. We have 200 volunteers that keep these libraries going. They also run a thrift shop, so they're helping sort of the disadvantaged parts of our community that way. I'm really worried that we won't be able to keep this model going because all my volunteers are turning 80 and 90 and so on. And that's sort of the, the complexion of what he was dealing with. So it's one of those success stories. And he wrote a research proposal that said, how to continue the most successful rural volunteer program in the country. It was very self-promotional that way. And I thought a community member is asking us to think critically about that uncertainty or that paradox of rural volunteering. So Amber went out, we developed a community-based project, and she actually did surveys with all of the volunteers, interviews with about half of them, and then focus groups with a smaller subset to try to answer questions around not just how the volunteers are facing challenges, uh, and not just how we might sustain the volunteer program for the township, but what is the relationship to the community in terms of those thrift stores, in terms of sustainability. And Selwyn is one of those places who is turning itself into a well-known retirement community. So the volunteer library is actually one of those amenities that helps sort of generate that economic renewal. So the library volunteers, just like the Meals on Meals driver, are directly involved in rural community development in an, age of, in an era of aging, even though they might not conceive of themselves that way. So Amber's probably blushing wherever she is at the moment. Um, the last 
themes really are these hidden ones. So these, in many ways, are sort of future-looking things. The idea that we know empirically that there's still a lot to uncover about the invisibility of disadvantage in rural areas, whether it's older people or not. So homelessness, poverty, these are very, very uh, prominent issues when we talk to rural leaders that aren't being addressed by policy and are being addressed in some ways in research but isn't being translated into policy and program decisions. So that's one of our main challenges. With the older population or the proportion higher in rural areas, we have larger prevalence of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And so we have a number of projects that are just starting to look at how you deal with dementia uh, within a setting where you may have smaller social support networks or lack of formal services. So Alzheimer's societies, for example, are struggling to provide uh, support groups in rural environments just because of the distance involved in getting people together, um, for example, on, on weekly support groups. There's a, always a, a hidden theme around the challenge of theorizing rural change. And so this is not um, the domain of gerontology necessarily, but understanding the complexity of that whole continuum of rural settlements in an era of globalization, in an era of aging, in an era of environmental change. Um, there's, there's theoretical work to, to be done, and we're starting to look at things like you know, the contested spaces of aging between people who have lived in a rural community their whole lives and people who move in there as retirement um, in migrants. And what are their expectations as citizens of the community in terms of volunteering or receiving services? And there's a whole interesting um, uh, set of studies to do in that regard. And then here's where we're seeing application of different perspectives. So critical perspectives, what we would call place-based perspectives, and uh, relational and non-representational perspectives in terms of really getting at these myths that we see in the media um, and how they actually help explain people's experiences. How am I on time, Gavin? Uh, so I have a, a video I'd like to show, which is about three minutes, and then I will finish very quickly. Um, this is an example of a project that we started looking at rural inclusion, rural social inclusion. And the reason I want to show you a video clip is it's really hard to explain to you what uh, a dance program run by Canada's National Ballet School for seniors in a rural environment looks like. Just tell me. So. So I'll we'll blame, let's just say Alan Joseph. Well, thank you. So this project started a year ago and will run for the next four years in Peterborough and in Brandon, Manitoba. The project uh, is a partnership uh, with Canada's National Ballet School, who's piloting uh, a sharing dance program uh, in the Peterborough region. We've been able to work with Community Care Peterborough. 900 volunteers are running community care programs across this region. And one of the reasons that we're studying the pilot program here is to actually see how a really well-functioning organization like community care um, can teach us lessons about the best ways in which to run programs like this, what are the challenges in terms of making it work properly, and then we'll translate those across Canada where other community care organizations are also interested in running these kinds of interventions. I'm a dancer. I know the physical and psychosocial benefits of dance because I've lived them, I feel them, and it's I know dance is fantastic, but that's not enough for, <laughs> for the scientist, for the researcher, and, and it shouldn't be. That's why we are hoping to research both the physical and the psychosocial benefits uh, to really um, be able to explain more, more clearly um, why we know dance is, is so great for Canadians. I think it's significant to be able to provide evidence for the impact that these programs have. We know that, that medical interventions are often required and important when you're dealing with the certain symptoms that come with aging, but we believe and know that dance as a complementary therapy or frankly just a positive regular activity is something that can probably um, improve your quality of life and, and uh, minimize your need for that sort of intervention um, from a medical side of view and it allows you to stir your soul as well as your promoting your health and moving your body. So having the evidence for that, which comes out of doing this kind of research, is really important in making that case to you know, medical professionals, neuroscientists, and other people in the community. 
I think the most important message is that social inclusion is one of those dimensions that's often neglected when we think about what it means to live with Alzheimer's disease or related dimensions, and what it means to take care of people who are in that particular situation. So funding and people who fund the Alzheimer's Society of Canada are allowing us to examine and actually have real impact on the lives of Canadians when they're facing these challenges. There's a recognition that the people who are delivering services on the front lines, as some are small nonprofits, they are the experts in program delivery. Uh, and in that spirit of collaboration, uh, for the government of Canada to tap into the expertise that exists at all these different levels just ensures that we have greater success and better results. I think one of the great things about this project is that in design, it's interdisciplinary and it's community based, and that requires the uh, development of very mindful relationships with partners and agencies and other researchers across the country. But that's also what we know works in rural communities when we're thinking about how rural communities are responding to challenges of rural aging and dementia and so on. They are innovating, they are integrating, they are finding different ways to develop partnerships. So in some ways we're emulating that model with our research design and we're really excited about the potential to succeed. Um, so that's an example of uh, something we're doing. This is the arts-based approach. Um, that was a little more promotional because the Alzheimer's Society of Canada is co-funding the project one and something to share with everyone. But I think it kind of conveys this idea of what a volunteer-based sort of dance program can, can bring. And we're much more interested about what it means for the people who are coming to this program and the people who are bringing them to the program, especially when we're working with um, clients with dementia and so on, and its effect on their inclusion than we are in sort of the neurological aspects of dance, and that's something that's being studied by other institutions. And so it's an exciting thing for us to be doing in terms of rural aging research. So what I want to uh, just uh, conclude for you with um, are a couple of comments for you. So I'll, I'll skip this quote, because uh, we can come back to this sort of stuff. One is that the importance of rural lessons, and so we don't study rural aging and aging rural communities uh, just for the sake of understanding rural better. We study them because we have questions about what it means to think about social issues or economic issues or planning issues or health issues within an aging society. And so there's a number of different lessons to be learned from rural environments, um, some of which have been prefaced in terms of work that's now been underway for 30 or 40 years, and some of which we hope in this sort of hidden theme is going to be undertaken uh, in the next decade or two. The implications for gerontology um, I would argue right across all of our questions around environment and identity and so on, uh, can benefit from studying these things within sort of smaller contexts. And part of this comes out of uh, lessons we've learned about looking at communities or people when they're not so much in a state of crisis, but when they're in a state of more acute change. So rural communities that are undergoing globalization and mines are closing and they're suddenly faced with um, funding or finding new ways to provide services for older people are coming up with interesting innovations that we're not seeing in places where there's a more static or stable sort of development uh, process. So the lessons from the frontiers includes some limits we have to age-friendly planning and limits to volunteering and distance and so on, the prospects of social inclusion, and I would argue for things like the sustainability of aging societies and so on. One of the key challenges I want to leave you with, and this really comes from Grand Rule's work in the 80s, is that we have to continuously find ways to actually distinguish and explain what is actually rural and urban in terms of these experiences. Because it's not enough just to say there's more older rural people and they have different experiences. There is something about rural that's different from urban, but there's also things that are exactly the same and universal. And that's part of our job as academics to try to have those, those conversations. And I think next is a thank you slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're all invited to come to Trent. I have to at least leave this up here. Um, so we're hosting an international interdisciplinary aging meeting uh, in May 2019. And if you have any interest in learning more about this, uh, you can certainly visit our website or contact me. So this is Aging Studies Networks in Europe and North America. 
um, and we're actually in conversations with the Gilbray Center with Gavin and Amanda Grandier about a role that Gilbray might be able to play in helping us uh, co-host and sponsor this exciting event. And I'll leave it there. This is the most important thing for people to see. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. going to be here for another hour, uh, we might have a, uh, you'd be available to answer uh, questions. I might take a couple though, uh, 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 right now, uh, if anybody has any. You covered so much ground, I, I, I don't know, you might have covered all the bases there. Yeah. I mean, one slide that I found really interesting that challenged some of my assumptions was the population distribution of aging, and I know that the slide that I got seemed to be what, what dominated, but I was really interested to see that the population of, uh, sort of rural, rural ground, like, the population of people in rural settings is actually increasing in Canada mm -hmm. over time, yep. uh, which I think would be a surprise to a lot of people. Yes, so James, that's actually uh, a good comment to me. This is one of those sort of myths that, yes, I use phrases like rural decline. Uh, we might interpret that different ways in terms of services and so on. Um, but the rural population in Canada is increasing. It's just not increasing, for example, as exponentially as the urban population. And if I use Peterborough County as an example, it has eight townships and eight rural townships and the city of Peterborough itself. And so of those eight townships, four of them are losing population and four of them are gaining population. But the county as a whole is increasing slowly. And that's partly because of part of those townships are very close to the GTA in terms of Durham and so on. And other parts of what we call sort of bush rural, where the population is quite dispersed and no one's actually moving to them. Yeah. Anybody else? You know, I, I always think about we have these debates in geontology, as we do in geography, where we, where we think about things like rurality, and you mentioned this, but you know, we as as as, as Researchers, we think we're talking about the same thing, just like as policymakers. But what is rural? It's so different. You mentioned it's a feeling. It's also could, you could look at it in terms of a measurement. But you, you still have huge differences. Like where I come from, Virginia, England, people would consider rural as ten miles out of the urban centre. Ten miles out of London, that's rural. Um, whereas in, in Australia, we've got this whole area of rural research. You could be literally hundreds and hundreds of kilometres from another settlement. And yet we have these debates about the rurality as if we're talking about the same thing. And I think that's a problem sometimes. You know? Well, oftentimes it comes down to common ways of translating what that means. Mm -hmm. So many ways are talking about how far people are willing to drive. Mm -hmm. and so many North Americans are happy to drive six hours in a day to get somewhere. And uh, my experiences with colleagues in Ireland is six hours would mean a major trip to the other part of the island. Mm -hmm. um, I think one, one way of maybe putting this in the aging context is uh, discussions we've had um, in relation to the development of new nursing homes and the sort of social context that's created within it that tries to embody sort of the history of the home and the community and so on. And some people might say, well, is it a rural nursing home because it's uh, located so far from the city or the, you know, the rural catchment area? Or is it a rural nursing home because it's actually located in a major subdivision in Burlington or Markham and so on? But inside, they've recreated what a rural general store would have looked like on that spot in that, in that village maybe 50 years ago that many of the people that are now in the home have direct connections to. And I like that example of kind of the emotional connection aspect of rural versus the locational aspect. And a policy decision maker think about that long-term care home, say to fund a rural arts program, um, might be just as convinced about the representational emotional connection of those murals as they would about the fact that the home or they have to be convinced in a locational sense that it's rural if it's in an urban setting. But if all the people in there want sort of that sort of mural aspect to it, then it certainly would have a rural aspect to it. Just quickly, and it's a little bit of a riff on, on uh, Gavin's question. Could you give a little bit of context around the libraries that you were working with or your master's students were, yeah. was taking a look at? Were they uh, bush, rural, you know, more rural, remote, or were they more peri-urban? Because this is a question that I'm dealing with as well in some of my own research. Yeah. You know, how rural, because you can drive 10 minutes from McMaster and be in a rural area, and then there's the connections back to the city in some respects, and maybe some limited transportation options, or you can drive further, you know, and, and it's not rural or remote, but it's a different sense. But I'm just trying to get a sense of sort of where those sure. cell so, so those libraries, um, 
I didn't show you a map of the county, but that one I showed you of Trent, if you veered off a little bit to the left hand side, you'd be looking at the township that has those libraries. So this would be a township that is what we call uh, partly agricultural, so farms, and partly rural recreational, so cottages. They would have maybe three towns within it, one of which would be Lakefield, which is a fairly uh, famous town in Pedro County. Uh, and the branches are located in what would have been the sort of urban, sort of the small town seats of previous smaller townships. And so one would be more uh, remote in the sense that you have to cross, you have to, you have to travel across a causeway across a river in order to get to it. And that causeway, what might only be a kilometer and a half long, is actually a barrier in people's minds as to how far away that actually is. But the other two branches are located within, for example, a five minute drive of my office at Trent University, which is right in the north end of Pedro City, which is about 100,000 people. And so it's a very sort of uh, easily accessible environment. I think what, you, what you're referring to, in a sense, are the different um, kind of realms of rural where, and so I'm thinking of some of our other colleagues in rural geography who do a really good job of reminding us, or in my sense, you know, training me as a junior colleague about um, there are differences when we think of fly-in communities, or we think of communities where um, it's a 14-hour drive to a hospital where someone who's undergoing issues in childbirth would have to go either by plane or air ambulance or someone driving very fast uh, versus living in Peterborough where I can be at Sick Kids Hospital in an hour and a half. Um, and so how we think about decisions that we made and those things sometimes have a bit of a disservice when we say someone who lives 10 minutes from Hamilton is living in a rural environment but for all intents and purposes is served by a major metropolitan hospital. Right? And so in terms of the sector, we would have to use different lenses that way. I think what we'll do is, 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 is we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up here because uh, we we're 10 minutes over. Give everybody uh, five minutes, so people might want to come, go, get a drink, go to the bathroom, whatever, and then we'll do the, uh, uh, we'll talk about the book afterwards. But uh, for now, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you.